So today, brothers and sisters, we are continuing our trek with the Apostle Paul. And as he is going through his missionary journeys, last week we talked about uh, Paul having some controversy uh, back in Jerusalem. We talked before that about his first missionary journey. And now we're going to embark with him on his second missionary journey. We're in Acts chapter 17, and this is called Paul the Bodybuilder. We're talking about the church as the body of Christ. But as our friend Arnold Schwarzenegger would say, I am here to pump you up. <laughs> and so we're going to pump up about God's plan for us to come down the line with our Bible and our ministry that he has planned for us through the ages. So God is building his family. That's basically Paul's entire thematic. God is building his family. And we've seen that it started down here in AD 30 with Jesus sacrifice for all mankind, his burial, then his resurrection, then his ascension, and leaving the disciples with the Holy Spirit. And we talked in the beginning of Acts about how at Pentecost the Holy Spirit came and then throughout the next decade around AD by AD 40 there were some churches that were sprouting up all in Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, and that whole area around Jerusalem. And then going out from there, we had Paul doing his first missionary journey in southern Turkey and the Galatia area. And then now we're talking about crossing over, as we talked about last week, that they came to Troas and they crossed over into Asia proper. And we're going to talk about, um, we talked about Philippi. Now we're going to talk about um, the church that is the Thessalonian church, the Berean church, and then finally the witness and a little tiny church starting in Asia. Athens. And so this is fascinating because it's where all of our Western civilization had its beginning. And it was not a great beginning. We're going to see that, but it was a great beginning for the church. So the Bible tells us in Psalm 90, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so the psalmist reminds us that this plan has been in the works for thousands of years by the time the church came into its own through the apostles and then now the apostle Paul. But we're also reminded by the psalmist and by Jesus that it must be our choice. God is not going to make robots out of anybody. God is not going to say, if you don't believe in me, I'm going to zap you dead right now. God says, I want you to be a part of my family. And so it must be our choice. And we're going to see some people today that are going to have to make the choice. And some made the choice not to believe in Jesus Christ and Paul's witness. So here we go with Paul making the choice. So this is Paul's second missionary journey about A.D. 50 through 52. And we can see and we saw last week as he began the missionary journey, <clears throat> they started out from Antioch going through Tarsus, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and then um, uh, Caesarea and Antioch and going on to Troas where Paul saw a vision 
of a man saying, come over and help us. And he did, the whole team went over to Philippi and didn't meet men right off, but met Lydia, the person who was a businesswoman who had a rather large small business concern and dying purple for the royalty, for the elite. She was planted there especially by God to be the person that would welcome Paul and his team in and be able to connect with them, support them, and continue to support them even after they were driven out of Philippi. So now we come today in Acts chapter 17 to we've got a little church that's starting in Philippi and we're coming to Thessalonica. So I want to read starting here in the first verse of chapter 17 a few verses. We're going to read the first uh, few verses there. Acts 17, 1 through 9. Acts 17, 1 through 9. And notice where they're going first. Now they've gone into Gentile land for real at this point in time. Most of the people that surround them are not Jews, but they're Gentiles. And so the word says, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. That's the good news. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the other brothers before the city officials shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They're all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. These Christians are troublemakers. They've come here onto our Grecian soil. In They've been to Philippi, and we've heard words from our synagogue over there that they are causing all kinds of turmoil because they're saying that the Messiah has come. Well, if the Messiah had come, wouldn't us Jews know about it? Well, of course we would, but we don't believe the Messiah has come. And so we are going to cause trouble. So they stirred up a mob from the marketplace. Back in Greece in those days, the marketplace was where everybody went, whether you were selling something in the market, buying something in the market, or whether you were just lollygagging around there in order to see what you could get into. And that's, they stirred up those people. Now, why would Paul, with all of this going against him, why would he go to a synagogue? For goodness sake, Paul, what's the point? Ah, good question. I'm glad you asked. The fact is that man learns most quickly while progressing from what he already knows. Don't you have that in your experience? That you learn something better, faster, because it's based on a foundation of something you already know? And then you springboard from that well, the Jews already knew very much about covenants one through six, right? The covenant of life, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with David, all of these covenants and all of this God that is really the right God, the only God. They knew all of that. So Paul goes in there because the Holy Spirit 
led him and guided him in there. And when that guidance took place, there were some that would say, I've studied enough of the Old Testament to know that that has a ring of truth to it. And we've been waiting for the Messiah. Why wouldn't we go ahead and accept that it's happened? And so they did. But some of them believed, some of them didn't. And then Paul springboards off the first six covenants to say, and now here's the new covenant. The new covenant that the prophets talked about. And it's come to you. And you can have freedom under this. Now, we don't understand why this was such a wonderful thing for even the Jews in the synagogues. The synagogue was always the odd man out. They were allowed to be in this uh, area. They were allowed to worship. They were allowed to worship Jehovah, but they were stuck there waiting for a Messiah, waiting for freedom, waiting for some hope. And they didn't have much. They were stuck. And so Paul comes in and says, hey, here's the new covenant in Christ's blood. And guess what? It's not only for Jews. It's for all you Greeks in the balcony that, aren't, that are second-class citizens as God-fearers to these people on the first floor. Well, that didn't go well on the first floor, I have to tell you. Um, but that's why he started in the synagogues. Man often has a heritage of works toward God and fears losing his investment in eternity. A lot of the Jews had investments, not only economic investments in working within the Roman and Grecian system, in order to make more money and do more things and be more proud, but they had an investment in Jehovah God, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they couldn't stop long enough to, to understand that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob brought Jesus to save all men's souls. They didn't want change. They didn't want to hear it. And so they felt like their investment in eternity as well as their investments under the Roman and Grecian system were all threatened. That's why mostly the leaders were the ones that were against Paul because the leaders had so much to lose that they had built up in not only being Jehovah's people that would eventually bring the Messiah, they thought, but also in making money off and through the system by compromising with the world. We have anybody that might be like that today? I leave it up to you to figure that. They said, we have no king but Caesar. Now get this point. The Jews went to the Gentiles and stirred up the marketplace and they came all shouting, we have no king but Caesar. Amazing. And like the python, they had been coiled around so much that they couldn't get out. We have no king but Caesar. And so Paul and Silas went on to Berea. And the next stop is Berea. But there's a check mark here. That means there's a little church that has started. Just like in Philippi, there's a little church that started in Thessalonica. Jason and all of his people, the brothers and sisters there, that came out of the synagogue along with the uh, Grecian brothers and sisters that believed in Jesus Christ after Paul's witness. The Holy Spirit got a hold of them. And so we got a little church that's happening. And then in Berea, don't you sometimes just want to have a breather if you're doing great work, if you're doing work for the Lord and you've come up against a bunch of problems and then you get to a place like this 
where for me, this is Berea right here. Cornerstone Baptist Church is Berea. It says, let's read about the Bereans in these next few, next few verses. As soon it was, as it was night, verse 10, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Here they go again. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. And so we're seeing here that the brothers and sisters got together and several of the brothers said, look, you don't know this territory. Let's get you down to Athens, which is where the Jews are few and far between. <laughs> and we're going to save you that way. And they escorted them and left Silas and Timothy there because they weren't as high profile as Paul to encourage the church in both Berea and Thessalonica and by way of Philippi. And so, Paul heads down to Athens. And we have to, before we leave Berea, to recognize that here in verses 10 through 15, the Bereans were practical. The other northern Greeks were not as practical. They were more on the road. If we look back here, they were more on this Roman road that was high in economic commerce. They didn't want anybody rocking their boat and causing them to fall off of that great trade and commerce that was coming via the Roman road to the east and then to the west. But Berea was more of a retirement community. Berea was a community where Roman citizens have, had come in, even some military officers, and had retired out of that and were really seeking to finish life well. That's kind of us, isn't it? We're all we're all older, most of us are older. Sorry, some of you young ladies, I apologize. Um, but we are looking to finish well. And that's what the Bereans were. So they studied the scriptures. They asked Paul to answer questions. They found the points in their own scripture where it said the Messiah's coming and who he would be and how he would come and all of these 101 signs of what the Messiah would be. And by golly, Paul nailed every one of those. Who wouldn't want to at least look into it? And so, in Berea, they were practical and they, Paul says, they were of noble character. They were not fear mongers and they weren't going out to get other people to do their dirty work like in Thessalonica. As a matter of fact, that church in Berea became such a anchor for Christianity in Greece as time went on. There, were, there are still 70 hidden churches all through Berea. And you can go there and take a tour today and you'll see all of these churches. You can take a church tour of the top 20 hidden churches in caves and in valleys and underneath buildings where the Bereans said, we're going to meet anyway. And there was a great anchor community that started in Berea. But then, of course, Paul went 
down to Athens. And that's where we're going to spend the rest of our time today talking about, because quite frankly, it's a very interesting place. And this is where he's going to come upon some very interesting enemy opposition. On the way to Athens, Paul would pass places that we all have heard of. He would pass Mount Olympus, which was between Berea and Athens. And even from Berea, you could see the top of Mount Olympus. And from Athens, you could see the top of Mount Olympus. And so that's where all of the priests and all of the storytellers said, that is the home of the gods, Mount Olympus. And that's where they send their messages through us, as long as you give us enough money, through us to give you the word of the gods. And so this Mount Olympus represented the gods' triumph over man. And it was a stranglehold to behold. He would also pass as he came past the foot of Mount Olympus to the plains of Marathon. Everybody's heard of the marathon? Some of you have run a marathon. Uh, I myself was proud to run a mini marathon and still stay on my feet. Uh, but this is the story, of course, where the soldier was running back to the Greeks to tell them that the Persians had landed and he ran 27 miles and then he dropped dead after he gave them the message. And so those of you all who are, you know, running marathons, be careful. <laughs> that could happen. It did happen, the first marathon. So he passed the plains of Marathon. What did that represent? It represented man's triumph. We are victorious. We are the champions. We beat them all off all these years. And so, even though that wasn't quite true either, they got taken over and freed themselves several times. But the plains of Marathon represented that man's triumph. So you've got God's triumph, man's triumph. But not our God's triumph, the God's triumph, the gods of Athens. And so, as we blow up the map here, we see that there's a little church in Philippi, a little church in Thessalonica, a little church in Berea, and then he goes to Athens where Zeus is the champion and is worshipped. And so you have this picture of the shining city. Let's read Acts 17 16 through 21 together. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is you're presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. And so Paul comes in to what they call the shining city, the city of Athens. And it was not only the shining city because it was the biggest and it was the best in that area. It was shining because of all the marble temples, all of the things that were there that were made by man for the gods. There was the Acropolis, which had on it all of these temples. It was crowned by the Parthenon, which was the beautiful temple that we see the ruins of today. 
It had a temple to Rome because, of course, the Romans were in charge of everything, so they built a temple for all the Roman citizens to come and give their gifts to Caesar and, and to Caesar as their human god, the god-man. It had a stadium seating 40,000 people. And guess what I found interesting? As I was looking at my fact books, their stadium track was... 666 feet long. Those of you all who know something about Revelation, that gives you a little tingle down your spine, doesn't it? <laughs> but not only that, the shining city with all these marble statues and all of this art and all the architecture, that was the center of philosophy. And it was the home of Sophocles, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Those were the shining lights through the ages, the top men of their day. They didn't all live at the same time. They sort of stair-stepped. Sophocles, you know, wrote plays. I'll bet you some of you all know some of the plays of so Sophocles. You probably read them in, in high school. How about Antigone? How about Oedipus Rex? And those plays, those were Sophocles' uh, plays. And it was where Sophocles had his stool. That's where Sophocles sat and re rehearsed and recited his plays and put together those things. And most of all, they were plays about how the gods work in their relationship toward man. One of them says, which... Shakespeare actually re-quoted, we are playthings of the gods. We are playthings of the gods. That's what mankind was. Just being shuffled around on a chessboard as God would move them. And then you had Socrates. And Socrates taught under the four pillow, pillars. And the four pillars was a youth group that came together and Sophocles taught them and said, you know, it's not exactly like it is in all the plays and in all the temple worship. You know, um, we don't know everything. We can't understand everything. But we must come to a higher moral ground for the gods, of the gods. In other words, the gods might be nasty at times, and might be like the worst men at times, but they did have a higher moral. And some of these Athenians out here are doing low-down stuff, and uh, we need to, as youth coming up, and you know how college students are, they're all hyper, they ADDHD or whatever, and they got a lot of hormones going, and they came all around... Uh, Socrates, and then Plato was one of those people that was the student of Socrates, and they came around him and said, yeah, yeah, the gods are all they're cracked up to be, but we need to, uh, to be men of higher standards. We could even be as high as gods if we can kind of work that out uh, over time. And guess what? Anybody know what happened to Socrates? They made him drink hemlock. The, the leaders, <laughs> he was bad for business. They made him drink hem hemlock and die. And then Plato came along in his olive grove. He met in the olive grove. And he uh, said, Socrates was not all wrong. But you know what? Uh, the people that killed him weren't all wrong either. Let's all live together. Can't we all just get along? And he did a lot of philosophy. And then, of course, you had Aristotle who had his walk. Aristotle didn't want to be like all those others, have their little places. He would walk all around Athens and his followers would just follow him and listen to him as he walked and talked. And he said, in understanding, we live and move and have our being. Who? Oh, that sounds a little bit like something we're going to hear from Paul in a little while, right? He said in understanding, in understanding the higher life, the higher spiritual plane that we can be on and working that through with men and women, we in understanding can live and move and have our being. And Paul's going to use that coming up on Mars Hill. And so 
Then we have finally Epicurus. Epicurus was sort of a person who was a Stoic. And it mentions here the Stoics came. And the Epicureans, who were the Stoics, said man is an accidental creature who must please the gods by emulating them. In other words, if it's okay for the gods to murder, it's okay for us. If we have to. I mean, some people just need killing. You know? And so, they said, whatever the gods did, no matter whether it was considered to be good and moral or not, we need to emulate the gods and be like them. That gave his people just the open range to do anything that they wanted to as long as they in their own brains could justify it. And that was him. And then to pull it all together we understand there were 3,000 statues to different gods and goddesses in Athens. 3,000. There was one to an unknown god. Now We've got to understand something more about what goes on with these gods. These gods lied, cheated, murdered, got drunk, raped, committed adultery, and committed incest. That was the gods of the pantheon. And if it's good enough for the gods, it's good enough for me, right? And so these were the gods. 3,000 of them. But there was one to an unknown God because sometimes a pestilence would come along and they couldn't attribute, they didn't want to attribute it to Zeus or any of the major gods and the minor gods might get mad if we attributed the pestilence to them. So let's just make a, a statue to the unknown God and that way we'll make offerings to him too or her, whoever it might be and that way we won't have any more pestilence. So you can see it was a whole system of fear. Fear, fear, fear. Fear of Zeus. Fear of Athena. Fear of Apollo. Fear of all of these gods. We've got to make offerings to them because we fear them. Because we fear them, they might get us. And, however, their character was like this. Because why? They were created by men of power. And men of power did this. Because they could. And so they were just like the men who created them that said them created them. You follow me? So what was the result of this whole society? The result of this whole society was deified vices. Deified vices. One of the contemporary philosophers of the day that wasn't from Athens came into town and said the Athenians perfected the temples of the gods who degraded their worshipers. Seneca who was from Alexandria came into town and he said all shame at sin is nullified in Athens. All shame of sin has been nullified by their worship of all of these gods and themselves in philosophy. And so it was a complete system wherein everyone preyed on others in the name of meaningfulness in the world. We are most meaningful because we give offerings to these gods and our particular set of gods has protected us. That means we're most loved by the gods. We're most meaningful in an eternal stance. And so, any of you all who aren't, we reserve the right to get rid of you deplorables. The elite in Athens could get rid of the deplorables in this complete system. Well, you know, it had to happen. I had to get America into your thought process. Are there some people who have said certain things from up east about us in the middle, in the south? Hmm, might they be Athenians? I think they might. Just saying. 
Now, Paul comes along, and here's where we get some good news. 22 through 34, we're going to finish out the chapter. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God this, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Once again, we've got a little group of people that listen to reason, that have more to gain than to lose. And they are accepting Paul. And so let's just in one or two minutes as we end up here, talk about what Paul said. They brought Paul down from Mars Hill. They set him up between the downslope of Mars Hill and the upslope of the marketplace, the Agora, and there was this little place that had a stone where you could step up on the stone and speak your mind. It was called the stone of impudence. If you're impudent enough to step up on that stone, you go ahead and see what we give, give you for a response because we're the people. And so Paul stepped up to the stone of impudence. He said, the God is Jehovah of the Jews, the God with that God's character. He's never been a liar, cheat, murderer like your gods. He doesn't need man's help or offerings, else he wouldn't be God. So you're wasting your lives. Oh, oh, that was not a good PR thing to say. You're wasting your lives. We make a lot of money off all these gods and all the offerings and the taxes to Caesar. What's going to happen to the taxes for Rome? And if the taxes for Rome fall, guess what they're going to do? Send soldiers in here. Oh my gosh, we can't let that happen. But Paul says, hey, with all of this stuff, you're wasting your lives. He says salvation under the God is found in his sending and sacrifice of the only anointed one, Jesus, who God raised from the dead as he will all who believe in him as the Messiah. Paul says, gather up all your statues and all your little idols and all of the trappings and get rid of all of them because you have a free gift for just accepting it. Faith in Jesus Christ, which will bring you God's favor and bring you God's love and bring you an abundant life. <clears throat> He's actually petitioning to bring the entire satanic house down. And we hear <clears throat> that he got two converts. Well, that makes me feel better for being the pastor of a small congregation. 
I got more than two. We got more than two. So what happened? Paul left there and went to Corinth. We're going to learn next week. Paul left there and went to Corinth. When he did, he left a little church there. And guess what? Within a hundred years of Paul on Mars Hill, Bishop Dionysius presided over a large church that is still there today, almost 2,000 years later, and has sponsored missionaries all over Western Europe and all over the Middle East. Within 500 years, Christian Emperor Justinian closed all the schools of Athens, all those philosophy schools. He closed them forever and said, no more of this nonsense. And the Parthenon was converted to a church memorializing Mary, the mother of Jesus. Did you know that? The Parthenon was not destroyed until the Muslims came in to Greece. Before that, they kept it up. Got rid of the, the um, statue to uh, Venus and put Mother Mary in there <laughs> and made that a memorial to Jesus' mother and uh, then it was made ruins later. Most people don't know that part of the story. And so, who won? The Jews? The Athenians? Or Paul? My last thought to you is meaningfulness is the primary human motivator. We've talked about, about that before. I've mentioned that to you before. Meaningfulness. You are wired to long to be meaningful in life. And so you ask the question, my life matters because. And I propose to you that in this room and in this church, we say there is no king but Jesus. We are marching under the Christian flag. No matter what happens to this flag, we love this flag. We don't like it to be tattered and broken like that. But a lot of other people say we have no king but Caesar. And we want our gods we want to be able to live exactly like we want to be able to live. It's our life. Don't you rock the boat. And we say, okay, but your boat's going down. Your boat's going down. You can see it all through history. Why don't you step in with us and march to victory? Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of these will be added to you in time. Next week, we're going to go to chapters 18 and 19 and try to get all of that in. But I'm bound and determined to do it. And so, it's titled, The End of the Beginning. Remember that great quote by Winston Churchill? This is not the end it's not even the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning. And so we'll see that next week. And let me pray for us as we prepare to go. Father in heaven, we thank you for this plan that is unfolding in front of our eyes of your church beginning to be on the march to save some out who will be saved even as we try to do that in our own land today, our job to expend ourselves to save some out as our Savior did and as the Apostle Paul. And we pray your help and guidance through the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.